Hello everyone, David A. Cox here with PCClassesOnline.com and today I'm going to be creating a video for all of you and I think this is going to be really helpful where I'm going to show you in depth what all the different preferences do on your Mac. Now my computer is running the latest operating system which is OS X 10.8 also known as Mountain Lion. If you are running an older operating system you may find that I'm going to show you some features here that you may not have. Now, if you don't know which operating system you have, let me first go just a little bit off track and show you how to find out. You're going to click on the Apple icon at the very top left of your screen and go to About This Mac. Now, you see here where it says version 10.8. Well, let me go through all, what all the different uh, numbers are and what their corresponding uh, operating systems are. 10.8, as I said, is Mountain Lion. 10.7 is Lion. 10.6 is Snow Leopard, 10.5 is Leopard, 10.4 is Tiger, 10.3 is, I believe, Jaguar, Jaguar or Panther. Put it this way, if you have anything before 10.4, it's time for a new computer. I don't think we need to go anything before that. It's sad that I don't even remember that. They just replaced them so often now, it's crazy. So we're going to go through item by item here, and I'm going to show you all the different features that you have. Um, now, the very last row here, for full disclosure, these are a bunch of things that I have put on my computer that I doubt any of you will use, so don't even worry about that last row. Um, I'm also going to show you some really nifty hints that could make your computing experience a hell of a lot better. Um, you may even find that you discover features that you didn't even know existed. So let's start. We're going to first here go into general, and at the very top here, it's very simple. We have uh, what color, for example, do you want the text to be when you highlight it? What color do you want the windows to be? I'm a blue fan, in case you couldn't tell. So uh, I choose to do that. Uh, you can choose what size you want the sidebar icon to be. Okay, if you want to change it to large, you can certainly do that. I just keep it on medium. This one here is going to be important, I think, to a lot of people. Now, recently, um, Apple made a change so that they went to multi-touch gestures. So, for example, if I open up uh, Safari, okay, oh, it's going back to, let's just go back to CNN here as an example. If I go back to CNN, you'll notice that there is no scroll bar on the right-hand side. And if I start to scroll, I do see it, but as soon as I stop scrolling, it disappears. Now, some people really like that feature. Okay, and if you want to get it back, all you have to do is change it from automatic to always. You can also choose so that when you do click on the scroll bar, uh, for example, midway down the page, you can have it jump to the next page or the spot that you just clicked on. By default, it's this top option here. I like to have it go where I want, so I go to the bottom option. Next here, we have a couple options uh, that have to do with documents, especially. Um, if you go to close a window, um, you can have the computer ask you to keep the changes. Okay, make sure you save those changes. Okay. Next, we can have the, when you close the window, it will um, like when I go to quit. For example, I use a application called Pixelmator. Okay, and when I quit out of it and then reopen it, it opens all the documents that I was working on the last time. If you don't like that feature, you can check this box, and it will disable that. Recent items, let me change it to five here for a moment. Now, I don't know anyone who actually uses this feature, okay? But if you want, when you click on the Apple menu at the top left, there's a thing here for recent items. You can see things that you've been working on. I don't ever use that, so I choose to just select none, okay? LCD font smoothing um, and turn off text smoothing for font sizes that are incredibly small. You can choose to use this or not, depends on your vision, okay? For the next item here, we're going to go into desktop and screensaver. Now, uh, desktop we'll start with. You can have, that's this big thing, okay, the background. Uh, on a PC, it was known as wallpaper. And you can have it be a whole bunch of different things. You can have it be your photos. You can actually turn it into a slideshow. Or you can use one of the many, many photos that Apple gives you that comes with your computer. So if I want to have it be on a slideshow, let's say I'm going to use the desktop pictures here. All I have to do is check this box here at the very bottom. Change picture every however often you want. And there's options for as, as uh, quickly as every five seconds or as late as every day. Now, here's a one little tip. I would never recommend doing every five seconds. And the reason why is that eats up a lot of memory on your computer. So it's a good idea to do at least a minute or preferably five minutes, okay? 
and you can go through here and check out some of the wallpaper that Apple does. Uh, the wallpaper, listen to me. Some of the desktop images that Apple does give you. And if you click on it, you'll see it immediately updates. Okay, you can go through them. Or if you have iPhoto and you've created either events or albums, what you can do is you can select one of those events. Let's see if I can find a good one. These are kind of dummy images. And, uh, and use this so it'll make a slideshow of your photos. Okay, let me go back to my images here. There we go. Screensaver is this tab right here at the top. Now, screensavers are basically irrelevant now because we all have uh, LCDs and LED monitors. We don't have to worry about burning an image into the glass like you used to have on CRT monitors. Those were the big the big fat ones. So uh, screensavers are pretty much useless now. They're more for entertainment value than anything. But uh, if you decide you want a screensaver, you can have it use your photos. Or if you want, you can have it use National Geographic's photos. You can go to some of these other options here, Cosmos, whatever you want. There's some pretty cool images in here. And over here on the left-hand side, you can choose what kind of a slideshow you want it to appear as. Some people like uh, the traditional, let's see, I think the original one was Ken Burns. Okay, that's where it just slowly zooms in and out of different images. You can also go classic, which is just still images. But you can also get kind of funky, and you go to other ones here, like shifting panels. Okay, you can see whatever you want. Now, there's a shortcut here, actually, to uh, tweak when you want the screensaver to start, which is down here at the very bottom. There's also an option where if you use the screensaver, you can have it show the clock on the desktop. Okay, like I said, doesn't really serve a point, but if you want, you can still enable it. Now, hot corners, this is a shortcut to it. However, I'm going to show you the other method in a little bit, which I think is in two, two more. Dock preferences, okay? So this is the dock here at the very bottom of your screen where you have all your little handy icons that represent the applications you use the most. And there's a little slide bar here, and I can choose to make it smaller or larger. Okay, I like my icons big. I don't use that many, so I like it easily accessible. Now, magnification here, you can choose to enable or disable. If you do enable it, what it means is that when you put your cursor over any of these icons, it's going to kind of blow up a little bit. See how it does that? See how it expands? I don't care so much about that, so I usually just disable it. There's this other feature here called uh, Minimize Window Using Genie Effect or Scale Effect. Genie Effect is, well, it's pretty well described that way. When you hit the uh, little yellow button here to minimize it, it kind of whoosh, flies away. Whereas if you change it to Scale Effect, it just shrinks down. I like the genie effect. It's cute. By the way, fun little, I, I like to throw out little fun facts here and there. Um, so there's a um, book that was written, I'm blanking on the name of it at the moment, but it talked about how the Mac was created under the influence of pot and Windows was created under the influence of alcohol. And they start talking about some of the little hints that the programmers put into the operating system to prove that that was the case. This is one of them. Um, and this is really stupid, okay? If you go to minimize a window and you hold down the shift key, look what happens. Now, this serves absolutely no purpose. They purely did it as kind of an Easter egg. It slowly disappears. That was the little hint they gave to show that basically they were all high when they designed the Mac. So I guess they knew how to have a fun time. Anyways, moving on. Uh, you can choose to position your dock. Let me close this window here. You can choose to position your dock on the bottom of the screen, which is how it comes, of course, by default, but you can also have it on either the left or the right of the screen. That's where you go for that. Down here, you can see we have some other options. For example, if you double click the a Windows title bar, which is this gray space at the very top, you can have it automatically minimize. Um, you can minimize windows into the application icon. Now, I don't like this feature. What this basically means is you saw how when I went to minimize this, it went over here down to the bottom right-hand side next to the trash can. If you have this option enabled, what it will do is it will minimize into the application where it came from, in this case, system preferences. I don't like that purely because I like to know what I have open at the time. That's all. 
You can have it animate opening applications, which means you know when it, you click on an icon and it bounces? Well, this is where you can go to enable or disable that. You can have it automatically hide or show the dock. Now, this drives some people crazy, myself included. I don't like hiding the dock because I don't know why. I just like to have access to it all the time. So if I move my cursor away, it disappears. If I put my cursor at the very bottom of the screen, it comes back. Finally, here on this uh, on this this preference, you can have it show indicator lights for open applications. And what that means is if you look, for example, at the very bottom of iTunes, you'll see there's a little teeny tiny white light. And that just shows me that that application is running right now. It's taking up memory. Okay. So if you don't care about that, you can always disable it. Um, I have 16 gigabytes of RAM, so I'm not actually worried about it, but I still, I don't know why, I still like having that feature. Next here is mission control. Now, as, uh, for those of you who have taken a lot of our classes and gotten to chat with me a little bit through the classes, you know I deal a lot with, I do a lot of private lessons, um, more than anything with people over the age of 50. And what I'm going to show you is one of the things that drives so many clients nuts. And many times it's one of those things where their kids will enable it and they'll be like, mom and dad, check this out, this is really cool. And then they don't tell you how to disable it and it drives you insane. This is the, this is the number one item, so just be aware of it. Okay. Um, it's not actually mission control. It's the very last item here called hot corners. So we'll get there in just a second. Now mission control is a new feature that allows you to basically have multiple desktops. And uh, to show you kind of what it is, let me manually launch it because I don't use it. So for example, I can have one desktop where I have uh, system preferences open, but I can also have another desktop where I have nothing open. Okay. I hate that. I just... I, I don't find it. For me, it doesn't work. So some of the options you have here, you can have it show dashboard as a space. You can have it automatically rearrange spaces based on the most recent one that you've used. Uh, when switching to an application, you can have it switch to a space with open windows for that, for that application. I hate that feature. You can have group windows by application. Okay, so all these different options if you use mission control. Most of you, just because I've gotten to know so many of you who take our classes, I doubt you'll use this. These are little shortcut keys that you can program to, init to enable mission control, show desktop, those different things. And now let's move on to hot corners. Okay, this drives me insane. So what you can do with hot corners, it basically means if I put my cursor in a certain, if I put my cursor in a corner of the screen, it will cause something to happen, specifically one of these. I can launch Mission Control, Application Windows, Desktop, Dashboard, Notification Center, Launchpad, Start or Disable Screensaver, or put the uh, display to sleep. So this is just such a pain because you go to click on Finder, for example, and where is Finder? It's at the bottom left. So if you just barely overshoot it and you hit that bottom left corner, you can put your computer to sleep. It's just a pain. So what I do is I choose the minus symbol for every corner, which means it is disabled. Good thing to know how to do. Moving on to language and text. Okay, so if you uh, are a couple and one of you speaks English and one of you speaks Belgian, you could have it so that with one click of a button, you can have it switch the whole computer between English and Belgian. Okay, and as you can see here, there are many, many many, many languages and different dialects as well. So if you choose to do that, you can have that. If you decide to, you may want to enable this feature here at the very top, which is to show the keyboard and character viewer. Let me show you another um, area where this can be helpful. Um, sometimes I'll get someone who brings in their laptop and it's maybe making a beeping noise. Okay, so for example, I'm going to make it happen right now. I don't know if you, I don't think you'll be able to hear it that well, but let's try. So you hear that beeping? So what that indicates is it means that there's some key that is depressed. Not as in it needs Zoloft, but as in it is pushed down. And sometimes what it is is they're on a laptop, for example, and they might get a piece of food caught underneath. So here's an easy way to diagnose which key is having the problem. If you check this box, you'll notice that you'll get the character viewer up here in the very, very top right of your screen. You can then go from here to show keyboard viewer and it will show you a layout. So if you were hearing that noise, you would see that the key depressed was the letter U. You saw that it turns gray when I press it. OK, 
Okay, just a good little trick to learn. Uh, I'm actually here on the fourth uh, tab. I'm actually going to go back to the first one. Sorry about that. So this is where you can uh, choose what language you want your computer to be in. Obviously, if you're using your computer, you've already set the default one. Text. Now this, I'm going to show you a really, really useful hint. Okay. So specifically dealing with right here, where you can deal with substitutions. Okay. So what this will do, for example, if I create a open parentheses followed by the letter C, followed by a closed parentheses, it will replace it with the copyright symbol. Same thing goes for R for the registered symbol. P, what is that? Parking? I don't know. TM, TM. Okay. And you have all these different things. So I can do, if I do one slash two, it turns into a, you know, one half symbol. But here's where it can get really cool. You can create your own. So as some of you have already seen, I have two custom ones here at the bottom. Here's the reason why. I type fast, okay? And there are certain words that I inevitably always type incorrectly. And for whatever reason, the number one word that I just can't spell correctly is the. So what I'll do is I'll type in H-T-E instead of the, T-H-E. So what I can do is program the computer so that when I make that mistake, H-T-E, and then I hit the space, it auto-corrects it. You can also make it so that it'll do uh, certain abbreviations. For example, I end up using the letters PCO for PC classes online. So if I type in PCO, hit the space bar, boom, it replaces it with PC classes online. And you can do whatever you want here. You can get really creative. By the way, parents, if you want to uh, pull a prank on your kids, this is great. If you want to pull a prank on your kids, do this. Go into their computer, go into text, and create substitutions for LOL, BRB, and all of those stupid abbreviations that kids use, which I'm ultimately guilty of using also. And you can make it so that when they say LOL, just have it say something absolutely ridiculous. And they'll say, Mom, something's wrong with my computer. And then you can, you know, break the news to them of what you did. And they'll be impressed that you actually tricked them. So uh, if you want to have some fun, you can do that. But you can do it with any kind of abbreviation you want, all right? You can even have, I don't even know how many characters you can fit in here. You could probably replace a whole letter, okay? So under region here, uh, this is one of those things where if you do, uh, if you're a business person, if you travel a lot, you may want to have easy access to this. Uh, regional data will affect things like, for example, currency, okay? So you can have it change between the U.S. dollar and the Uzbekistan Psalm. I know what that is. Don't you? Anyway, you can also change between date layout, which day of the week appears as the first day. So if you don't want Sunday, you can have it be Monday. Okay, you can change that however you want. And uh, I already showed you input sources. So that's that. Next, we move on to security and privacy here. Let me close this window below, uh, behind. We have four tabs on security and privacy, general, file vault, firewall, and privacy. And uh, this is going to be an important one for some people. Um, now, if you get uh, software from the internet, um, one of the things Apple has done is they have created a system so that you cannot install it unless you have this fe feature here changed. Now, when you first upgrade to Mountain Lion, by default, I believe it's here at the very top, Mac App Store only. So what it means is if you try to install software that you didn't get through the App Store, it's not going to allow you. They did this as a reason to try to fight off uh, viruses. Um, which there aren't many of anyways, um, but in my case, I use so much custom software, I can't possibly do that. And by the way, if you run, if you take our classes, you need to have it on, I believe you have to have at least identified developers. You may need to change it to anywhere. I'm not sure if, I can't remember which. Um, let's say you have um, kids or you have some sort of sensitive information on your computer. If you look up here at the top part of the screen, you can set a password to your computer. And for example, if your computer goes to sleep, you can have it require that password immediately in order to continue using. Um, you can have it uh, disable automatic login. Okay, different options here depending on what you do with your computing. File Vault. Okay, big warning here. Unless you work for the CIA, don't use File Vault. It will totally come back to haunt you in the in the end. What File Vault will do is it will encrypt all of your data. And the problem is that if uh, your hard drive fails and you need to recover data, uh-uh, not happening. So strongly recommend that you do not turn this on, okay? Next here we have Firewall, which for most of you, uh, I'd recommend turning on. 
And in my case, I can't just because I use so many different devices. What this will do is it'll uh, say no computers other than your own, no computers allowed to access your data other than your own. Okay, really simple. Just turn that on. Finally, here in privacy, uh, you can choose what apps have access to your information. Okay. Oh, sorry, I forgot to mute my phone. I'll return that call later and put my phone on vibrate. Here under Twitter, for example, yeah, see, I don't even use Twitter that much. Um, and you can have under contacts, you can say, well, these are the different applications that I'm going to grant access to using my contact information. Okay, Chrome, for example, I do that because uh, when I go to buy something online, it already has my name and address filled out into it. Screenflow, I don't really need, so. Eh, let's do it later because I have it running, of course, right now to record this class. Yeah, we'll do it later. Moving on. Moving on. Uh, Spotlight here. I don't think a lot of you are going to really need to deal with this. Spotlight is this little spyglass here at the very top right of the computer, and you can use it to search for any item in your computer. You can choose it to ignore certain types of items like images. So maybe you have, you know, I'll do some air quotes here, sensitive images, uh, and you don't want them to pop up. You can just disable images here, okay? Um, you can have it also not search in certain folders, okay? If that's the case, you can actually just drag the folder into this space right here. Now, you can also see down here we have the options for um, if you want to uh, search for anything and you don't, you're too lazy to click up here, you can hit Command Space Bar. You can tweak that shortcut if you like. Again, not something I think a lot of you are going to be doing. Notification Center, this is something that came in with the most recent operating system, Mountain Lion. And it's this button here at the very, very top right of my screen. And what it'll do is it'll show you um, different notifications that have come in either by email or Twitter or calendar, whatever you want. And you can just kind of go through here and choose what items you want to show up and which items you don't want to show up. So if you don't care about having email show up, you can go to None. Now for each of these, you have these uh, options here when you click on the application. So, for example, you can have it show or not show Notification Center. I'm going to take this one. Well, I'll leave it on for now, I guess. You can have it show the five most recent emails in this case, or 10 or 20 or however you want. Okay, you can have it do kind of a little banner style where it'll just kind of flash across the top part of the screen. Or you can have an alert where you will actually have to click on something to get it to go away. Okay, depends on what you do. Um, a lot of people use messages here and put that into alerts. Okay. But something like Game Center, most people don't care about, so they'll turn that off or just go to none. Okay. Next, we have here, we're finally into Category 2, which is hardware, and we have CDs and DVDs. So what this means is that when you put in a CD or DVD, you can have the computer automatically do something. For example, if I burn a lot of music CDs, I can make it automatically open iTunes when I insert a blank CD. Or if I insert a blank DVD, I can have it automatically open iDVD, okay? Really whatever you want. You can also, if you have a, uh, like a music CD, that can launch iTunes. Photo CDs, you can have it open iPhoto. Now if you have another photo application like Aperture, um, you can have it open that instead just by simply clicking open other application. If you have a DVD, okay, a movie you want to put on, you can have it automatically launch the DVD player. And if these actions annoy you, you can always choose the last option here, which is ignore. Actually, you know what? I'm going to unmind. Oh, no, this is my dummy account. I don't care about it right now. Displays. Okay. Uh, displays, you have two different options here. Displays and color. For the most part, color you can probably leave alone because it, the, the monitors come pre-calibrated. The only part where you might need that is if you uh, happen to be dealing with an external monitor. So under displays here, I have different resolutions. The higher the resolution, the clearer everything is. Now, here's an example where you may not want a high resolution. If you have trouble with vision, one of the things you can do to make everything bigger is you can lower the resolution. And you can just kind of try the different numbers and see if you like it or not. And it will make everything bigger. It will also make it less clear. Just, be, just understand that. Below here, we have the brightness of the monitor. Now, none of you will see that changing. Only I can see that. Okay. Here under color, you can choose to uh, calibrate different monitors or diff to different profiles rather. 
Um, this is something that a lot of high-end photographers will use to make sure that the blue that they're trying to get is the exact shade of blue on the screen. Okay, just makes it all happy. Next here we have Energy Saver. Uh, more than anything, this is really important for laptop users. Um, just if you leave the room, you don't want your computer necessarily running that whole time. Okay, you might as well save yourself some battery life. And uh, you can see here that you can have the computer go to sleep after however often, or the display. Now, the amount of time it takes your computer or the display to come back from sleep, I mean, we're talking a second. Uh, in the case of the computer, maybe two seconds. So I tend to recommend that people do put their computers to sleep because it's just it's so fast to come back to life. You know, why bother wasting all that battery life? Now, if you're on a laptop, I'm currently on my desktop, you will have a second option here where you can have one setting for if the computer is plugged in and one setting for if you're on battery life. So that's something I want you to be aware of. You can also tell the computer to put the hard disk to sleep when possible. This will just kind of put less wear and tear on your computer. Um, so you can choose to enable or disable that. Wake for network access is important if you use multiple computers and you want to access files from one computer on another. It's important to have that enabled. Uh, if you click the power button in the back, you can have that put the computer to sleep. I actually hate that feature because a lot of times it means I'm trying to do something else other than just put it to sleep. Um, if the power fails, you can have it automatically start up again. I don't recommend using this option because if there's a power failure, usually that means that there is something like a thunderstorm or a severe th snowstorm. And if that's the case, you don't want to go crashing your computer over and over and over again. So if it's one of those things where the power keeps coming on and going off, you really don't want to do that to your computer. You can also set a schedule for this if you like. So you can have it automatically wake up every day at a certain time or go to sleep every day at a certain time. If only that it was that easy for us humans, that would be really nice. Next we have keyboard, okay? Pretty simple, but you can um, tweak some shortcuts in here, okay? Not something I suspect a lot of you are gonna be doing, but uh, you can choose to enable or disable different shortcuts for all the different applications. Here on the keyboard tab, which was on the left-hand side, I should probably started here. Uh, you can make it so that uh, you can change the key repeat speed, okay, or the delay until it repeats. So if I do fast here, for example, let me try to show you here. So if I open notes and I hold down, let's just hold down the H key, you can see that when I hold it, it does not repeat, okay. Whereas if I go down to slow, Oops, you know what? I screwed that part up. My bad. That's what I meant here. Sorry. Delay until repeat. That's what I meant here. Uh, this is where you can change that speed. Okay? So key repeat will basically just kind of look for if you accidentally hit a key more than once, and it will ignore it or uh, accept it. Okay? Usually most people just put it right in the mid middle. You can change your keyboard type, okay, if you use a different keyboard that didn't come with your computer. Um, I don't think any of you will need that. Modifier keys, um, it's pretty standard stuff, but this is a good thing to know in case you ever need to. Uh, you've seen these symbols pop up anywhere? Well, the, uh, the little arrow with a line underneath it is caps lock. The uh, little, what do they call it? I think that's called a caret, uh, is the, actually the control key. Option key is this little diagonal line, and the command key is the four little circles all tied together. Okay? It's good to know. Moving on, we have the mouse. Okay, so you can change the tracking speed. So if you, um, like, I, like I said, in, I, working with people sometimes in their 70s and 80s, I get people who they have to constantly pick up their finger and move it so they can get down to cover the whole size of the screen. Theoretically, here's the way to determine a good tracking speed. At your optimal tracking speed, you can go from the top left corner to the bottom right corner without ever having to take your finger off of the trackpad, okay? Scrolling speed has to do with, uh, if I'm, for example, in a document, and I'm scrolling through, I can have it go really fast or really slow. I tend to prefer it on the fast side. Um, in dealing with sometimes, again, older people, they're not able to double click as fast as other people. 
So if you uh, if you're that kind of person, especially if you have arthritis, that kind of thing, you may want your double click speed to be slower. So if I click click, it will be the same for you as it is for me if doing click click. All right. So if you're older, you may want to have this just be a little bit on the slower side. Okay. I like mine right in the middle. Primary mouse button. I think everyone pretty much does left these days, but you can switch it. Trackpad. This is for those of you who are on a laptop or have a desktop with the Magic Trackpad, which is what I use, and I love it. So what the Magic Trackpad does is it allows you to have multi-touch gestures right on your desktop. So there's three different um, options here, and what's really handy is if you put your cursor over any of these, it'll give you a preview of what it does. For example, tap to click means if I just very lightly just tap right on my trackpad, it'll be the same as pushing down and depressing it to click. Now, I can't do this because I uh, make a lot of unnecessary clicks when this is enabled, but here's the funny thing. On my laptop, I do have this enabled, so it's a personal preference thing. Uh, those of you who originally came over from PCs, you know, PC users have a right click and a left click. Mac users have a secondary click, which means that when you have two fingers present on your trackpad and you click, you get that series of additional options. You can also look up a word by tapping with three fingers. You can drag the window by just holding three fingers down and while clicking on the top bar of a window. Scroll and zoom controls, okay. So for example, when, I, um, when they came out with, I think it was Lion, they actually reversed scrolling, okay? And uh, the idea is that it's actually more intuitive this way. Uh, they call it natural movement. Now, if you don't like this new feature, you can disable this, okay? And go back to the original form. Zooming in and out, you can use by just simply spreading your fingers on your trackpad. Smart zoom, all you do is you put your cursor somewhere where you want to focus and then double tap lightly with your trackpad. Especially with things like photos, you can rotate them just by rotating your fingers on your trackpad. And here under more gestures, you can see a whole bunch more. You can go through at your own pace and kind of decide what you want. For example, swiping between pages on Safari or any web browser for that matter. You can just use by sliding two fingers left or right. Okay, you can go through those on your own. Print and scan. Uh, Creating a, adding a printer on a Mac is so easy. Um, all you really have to do, you know, every printer comes with a disk these days. And unless I've found, unless you have a, what was the one computer? Um, if it's a wireless printer and you have a Mac mini, sometimes you do need that disk. Uh, in which case you need an external optical drive. But usually with a Mac, the Macs come pre-installed with drivers. And if you're not familiar with what a driver is, if it sounds like I just started speaking Greek, here's what it is. A driver is like the messenger between your computer and a wireless device. So, um, or a device, I should say, more generally. So, for example, if I have a um, new printer that I buy, the method, the communication method for the computer to talk to the printer is already built into my computer. So, all I would have to do is plug that printer into my computer, hit the little plus key right here, and it will look for any devices, and boom, it sees my printer. There it is right there. I love that printer. You click on it, hit add, and you're good to go. That's all you have to do to add a printer on a Mac. You can change your default printer. Let's say I deal with some people who have uh, multiple homes. Um, if you uh, travel between them, you can have your default printer be, uh, you can change it, go between multiple printers, whatever you want. Sounds, okay. Not many people need to use this, um, but let's say you go and get an external microphone like the one I have. Okay, you might want to make it so that your internal microphone is uh, either the internal microphone or you can use different ones here. I use the blue snowball, which is configured for the program I'm running right now, just not the computer. Okay. Internet and wireless. Okay, the first one here is iCloud. Now, iCloud is an application, it's a, it's a service actually, technically, that will synchronize all of your data. So, for example, if I have an address book on my Mac and I have one on my iPhone, I have one on my iPad, it'll synchronize all of them so that as soon as I add someone to my iPad, for example, it'll already be on my computer, okay? And uh, to create an iCloud account, you have to have an Apple ID 
all right? And um, we are going to do an entire class on iCloud because that can get complex. What I recommend is that if you have iCloud issues, come to one of our classes because that's where we can really get specific and answer your questions live. Mail contacts and calendars is where you can go to add in additional mail accounts or uh, if you have, let's say you have a Google Calendar, you can add it so that it talks to iCal, as in, or sorry, calendar as they now call it. They no longer call it iCal. If you want to change up your network settings, that's where you go right here. So you can see I have a Wi-Fi connection. If you haven't heard the story, we have uh, atrocious neighbors. And so to screw with their heads, I renamed our wireless network DEA Surveillance Van. You can guess correctly that they do a lot of drugs, unfortunately. Now, let's say, um, let me go over one thing that a common issue that I run into with clients is maybe you live in an apartment building, for example, and your neighbor has wireless and you find that your computer constantly goes onto their wireless. Here's how you disable that. Go here under Advanced. And what you'll do is you'll see every wireless network that you have ever connected to and saved to your computer. So all you have to do is either take your wireless network and move it to the front of the line. Okay, just drag it to the very top of the list. Okay. Or, let's say Netgear here is your neighbor. You can click on Netgear and hit the minus sign and it will forget that network. So from now on, it'll go straight to yours. All right. Next, we have Bluetooth, which is pretty simple. Um, there's not much I can show you with it because we're doing a class right now. But if you have a Bluetooth keyboard, for example, that you want to add, all you would have to do is go into Bluetooth, hit the plus symbol here to add a new device, and uh, turn on the keyboard. And it'll have you usually type in a few keys um, just to link it up, and uh, you're good to go. Sharing. Okay. If you have uh, more than one computer, like I do, um, sometimes you want to have access to files on that other computer from the computer that you're on. And to do this, all you have to do is enable file sharing. You can also, for example, I can, uh, my laptop is closed in the other room, but if it was open, I would be able to uh, share the screen. So I can actually take over my other computer from here just by having this feature enabled on both computers. Next, we have users and groups, okay? Now, sometimes, uh, like parents, for example, you have kids. You don't want kids to have access to your stuff because you're afraid that they'll delete it or screw it up or something like that. Easiest way to deal with this is to create a new user for them. And to do that, all you have to do is hit the plus symbol, and you can choose what type of account. You can do standard, administrator, managed with parental controls, parents, okay? Sharing only or a group, whatever you prefer. Um, and you can create a password here. Now, depending on who you are, like I said, I do deal with a lot of uh, boomers. I recommend, unless you live in a major city, not having a password to your computer. And to do this, if you do have one, you can hit change password on your account. You will have to verify your old password, but just leave the rest of these blank. Um, and the reason why I say that is, if you forget the master password to your account, Resetting it is uh, sort of a what do they call, what's the expression? It's a bag of worms uh, because what happens is your computer uses this thing called a keychain, and the keychain stores all of your passwords. So if you bring your computer to someone like me and I have to reset your master password, it's going to destroy all of your saved passwords to email, banking information, everything, and it's just kind of a nightmare to have to rebuild it. The other thing you can do here in users and groups is you can create a guest account. This is really handy and you know right now we're approaching the holidays. This is a very nice feature to have. Let's say you're hosting a Thanksgiving dinner. You've got your whole family coming to visit you and they say, hey, can we go on your computer and check our email? Well, you don't want them seeing your email. You don't want them seeing your photos. You don't want them going through your web history. So this is a way to get around it. By enabling a guest account, what will happen is that if you go to the Apple icon at the very top, you'll be able to log out of your account, and you'll see a new account called Guest. And it's just like a clean account. They can't see any of your information. They can do whatever they want, but as soon as they log out, 
everything that they've done is deleted. It's a really nice feature. As you can see here, you can also make the guest account parent control enabled. Okay, We'll go over that in just a minute. Actually, now, parental controls, here we go. So if you uh, decide to have parental controls, you can attach it to pretty much any account. Okay, And you can do things like you can limit what applications they can use. Um, what they can do, you can not allow them to modify the dock. Um, on the web, you can have it uh, attempt to, hold on a second, you can have it attempt to limit access to adult websites automatically. Now, if you're really uber concerned about this, there is a uh, service that you can use. If you want to look it up, it's called OpenDNS. I believe the website is OpenDNS.org, and you can check that out um, and put that on not just any Mac, but any PC as well. What that does is it filters the web from the, uh, from the web level not from the computer level. Here under people you can limit access to email um, so you can only let your kids uh, chat with certain people. Um, here's a big tip if you do uh, if your kids do use Game Center if they play games on their computer even if you don't limit anything else I would recommend just watching out for this um, only allow kids to I wouldn't allow them to add Game Center friends reason why is for a lot of uh, child predators this is one of the ways they can go after kids is they'll play these games online with them and then try to lure them in not trying to be scary I'm just trying to inform people um, that you might not want to allow kids to do this time limits so if you say you know what kids after a uh, nine o'clock no computer uh, you can make it so that if they try to use the computer you'd have to know the administrator password to get on okay so you can Choose here what time the computer is unavailable for, okay, or what time it is available for, rather. And here under other, uh, you can hide profanity in the dictionary. God, remember back when we used to look up naughty words in the dictionary? God, we were boring. Um, limit printer administration, limit CD and DVD burning, that kind of thing. You can check those all out. Date and time preferences, okay, you can have a digital clock or an analog clock. Let's go actually let's start here on the left-hand side tab. Uh, you can have it automatically change the date and time. This is what I do. So now when we have daylight savings change, I don't actually have to change any of my devices other than wall clocks because my iPhone, my iPad, my iPod, they all change automatically. If you're traveling, you can have it automatically set your time zone based on your location. Okay. Um, or if you want, you can disable this and manually change it. And finally, under clock, you can have a, a digital or an analog clock. You can do 24-hour clock display if you like, okay, however you want. Some people like the computer to announce the time on the hour. If you want, you can do that. I find it annoying. Software update. This is one of the ways you can run software update. The more common way is to click on the Apple icon and go to software update. But that'll just look for the most recent update to the software you already have. Let's go over one definition here real quickly. Uh, there is um, update and upgrade. And a lot of people don't know the difference. Upgrade means you're paying for it. Okay. So if I upgrade from iLife 09 to iLife 11, that means I'm going to be purchasing it. Update means, if, for example, if I have OS X 10.8, it'll bring it to 10.8.1. Okay. So it's just bringing it to the latest version of what you have. These are the different preferences actually for software update. So you can have it automatically and the settings that I have here, I strongly recommend you copy them. Just check everything, okay? So uh, it'll just automatically check and it'll download newly uh, available updates in the background, okay? You can do really whatever you want here. Um, and if you want to check it right now, you can click here where it says check now. Speech and dictation is probably the most popular setting built into Mountain Lion. Okay, if you have Mountain Lion, you have this feature. Here's the key thing. When you first buy your computer or when you upgrade your computer, by default, this is turned off. So what this means is that now built into the Mac, we have dictation. And let's just go right back into Notepad. Oops. So what I can do is enable this, and you can choose what shortcut key you want to use. Typically, use either the, the command key or the function key. On this computer, I use my command key, and all you do is uh, tap it twice, 
and when you double tap command it's going to make a little ding noise and it's going to start listening to you and so then at that point you can talk whatever you want and this works with anything you can use this with email documents notepad whatever you want Microsoft Office it makes no difference and when you're done just tap the command key again and it will finish uh, listening so let's try it out the dog walked to the park there you go and it dictated what I just said into text very very popular feature uh, I deal with a lot of people with arthritis and they love 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 that feature time machine is one of the most important parts of the uh, Mac what it does is it automatically backs up all of your data I've turned off right now purely because I turn it off when I teach um, that way it doesn't slow anything down so what this does is if you have an external hard drive okay if you need a uh, if you want a recommendation on an external hard drive shoot me a quick email I'll be happy to send you a link um, David at PC classes online.com but when you plug in an external hard drive for the first time your computer is gonna say would you like to use this as your backup and as long as you then say yes time machine will turn on and it will automatically back up all of your data every hour and the way it works is the first time you run it it backs up everything the operating system all of your data all of your programs but after that first backup it just ups it just updates changes so after that first initial backup it's really really fast and so then using it you can either go back in time and retrieve files or more likely if your computer when your computer's hard drive fails you can use your backup to bring back all of the information accessibility this is great for anyone who has a disability uh, whether it's a, uh, a visual disability audio dis not audio disability what am I trying a audio you get what I'm saying so you can choose here for example you can make um, the I mean you can really go through this on your own depending on um, if you have one or if you know someone uh, you can really make the computer work for you voiceover as an example is uh, great for people who are hard of seeing if you enable voiceover it will speak everything to you basically it'll take you through training okay for uh, if you have uh, problems with hearing you can have the screen flash every time there's an alert so for example if I hit this right now you see it just gives me a quick little flash and lets me know that there's some sort of an error message uh, what else we have here and I mean you can really just go through here and go through all the different options um, there are certain items that you're able to speak and you can go through and have it um, just change which key makes it listen to you okay so really you can explore those however you need startup disk most of you will never need but if you uh, have more than one for example I have a hard drive that has a second operating system on it I can choose to boot off of that not something any of you I suspect will be using and that's about it because I already said that all of these items here are custom I put those on for me for my uh, tech work that I do here so I hope uh, you learned a lot in this class and like I said if it's not something you need access to right away um, if down the road you run into a problem and you think there's got to be a setting for that feel free to come back and check out this video have a great day, everyone. This is David A. Cox with PCClassesOnline.com. Take care.